One of my friends who's also a one of the longest uh, people, members of the Patreon crew that I've had, always gives me a hard time saying that I motor too much. And it caused me to think, how much is too much motoring versus sailing? I mean, obviously, if you're going to motor everywhere, you're kind of stupid buying a sailboat, especially a blue water boat, if you're going to motor everywhere. So where do you draw that line? So that's what I really wanted to talk about today. Hello and welcome. My name is Tim, and uh, for three weeks I uh, work on a tugboat like this, and then I have three weeks off and I hang out on a boat like this. Actually, this boat. I bought this boat a few years ago, and since then I've been sailing it up and down the east coast of the U.S. and into the Caribbean. We've uh, been fortunate enough to put uh, about 6,000 miles under the keel in the last few years. And uh, these are some of the things that I've learned in that time. Stick around, I hope you like it. So I think that when you look at the overall cost of ownership of a boat, a sailboat, one thing that I like to think about is that, you know, people often say, oh, sailboaters, uh, they're, they're so cheap, they don't want to buy fuel. And actually, I, th I think fuel is probably the least expensive thing that we spend on sailboats. Hmm? My radios are going off over here. So one of the things that I like about, I mean, obviously nobody likes to pay a bill, but one of the things that I think about when it comes time to pay a fuel bill is that unlike most of the bills you get during boat ownership, fuel is one of the only things that's in direct correlation to how much time you spend on the boat. In other words, whether you step foot on your boat or leave it anchored up or, or you know, uh, moored at the marina forever, you're going to pay the same amount for insurance all the time, whether you're using it or not. You know, uh, most of us have mortgages on our boats. Um, that's going to happen whether you use the boat or it's, you get it laid up in the yard somewhere. Same thing with your uh, marina fee, whether you use your marina or mooring, whether you're using that or not, you're paying for that whether you use it or not. But fuel, you're only paying for fuel when you actually use it. And um, I'm not saying that that's why you should burn a lot of fuel. What I am saying is that if somebody wants to sail hard, and I, I, I should change that. I should say if somebody wants to use the utility of their cruising boat and cruise a lot, you're probably going to have to use your engine, especially if you're not retired. If you're retired, you can choose your weather, you can choose the wind, you can choose all that stuff. If you're like me and you're still working, un you know, I've said this a million times, but those of us that are on schedules always have to get back at a certain time. And uh, obviously we don't want to put the boat or our own lives in risk, but Sometimes you got to go when it would be much better if we waited a week and had a nice beautiful sail and we got to motor through everything. And so that does happen. So in the two plus years that I've had the boat, I've gone over 8,000, coming up on almost 9,000 miles that I've put underneath. The thing. But uh, I've put a lot of hours on. And so uh, my friend out there that gives me a hard time about that, Jen, you're absolutely right. I do run my engine a lot, and uh, but I also go a lot of places. It's not uncommon when you're looking for a boat to buy that you might see a boat that's 20 years old that might have 400 hours on the engine. And there's a whole bunch of debates on whether it's better to run an engine or not to run an engine, to have many hours on it, or you know, it, it, many times an, a 20 year old engine might actually be in better shape if it's used often as opposed to a, something that has set and uh, doesn't have a lot of hours on it. And it's very similar to your car. You know, you leave your car somewhere forever and it might not be the same car that you come back to years later. And the same thing happens with a boat. Um, but the Yanmar engine that I have, and most marine diesels for that matter, if you keep them, if you keep them you know, well maintained, um, they should last a long, long, long time. And uh, it would not be unheard of 
to at least, I mean, uh, well, let's put it this way. If I bought a car, I remember when I was a kid, somebody was bragging that they had 100,000 miles on their car. And that was like an unheard of thing back in the 60s and 70s. Today, I don't think any of us would buy a car and be happy with it if the thing died within 100,000 miles. I think most of us are, especially those of us, that are, I'm, I'm a big Toyota fan, and I think those Toyotas, man, if I don't get 250, 300,000 miles out of my Toyota before I have any major problems, I feel ripped off. Well, I think the same is true with a marine diesel. Um, there are those that will say, oh, you know, I had this engine and it died at this time and this had to be, this seal had to be replaced or this water pump had to be replaced. And there are things that are wear items on them, but if you talk to commercial fishermen, I mean, I work with, you know, being, the company that I work for has a lot of uh, people from what we call the mid-Atlantic states, a lot of crabbers that also work on tugboats on their time off. And uh, many of them tell me that they have, Yanmar engines, they put 20, 30, even 40,000 hours on these engines. Um, I don't know that I'm going to expect to get that kind of use out of my engine. I would, <laughs> that, that would be wonderful if I did. But anyway, I think that while you are using your engines, and, and like I've, I've also put this in other videos, if you're looking, if you want to see what I do, you can go back and look for these videos. But when I do an oil change, the cost of an oil change is very small compared, or the cost of a engine oil analysis is very small when you look at the whole cost of an oil change. And every time I do an oil change at 250 hours, I always do an oil and filter change and I send out an oil sample. And for the $20 that I get, um, not only do I get peace of mind that everything's cool, but it will, I also have uh, archival data that shows when things are starting to happen and if they're starting to happen or if this is just a normal thing that has always been showing up in all the tests. And uh, so that's how I, uh, that, that's, that's what I'm doing to keep my engine up. I also think too that, that the more I run it, the better it, 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 it likes to go. There is something that I am concerned about and that's that I don't run my engine hooked up that hard. Part of the problem that I have not having a boost gauge you know, uh, for those that don't know, when when a when something with a turbocharger is idling, the, the exhaust gas pushes on a turbine, and that has a shaft that goes over to a compressor, and the compressor compresses air and pushes it into the engine. Um, unfortunately, until that until you get enough gas to really get that turbine spinning it's usually not enough to push everything through. So they have something they call a waste gate sometimes and other things. But one of the fears that I have is when I run the engine slowly, that I, I, I don't want to run the engine prolonged for a prolonged period without that waste gate being open. And it's very difficult for a layman like me to know where that is other than by trying to listen for the turbo. Um, because if you had a boost gauge, you would see it reading zero, 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 you know, it would be zero, and as you increased RPM, it would be zero. Then it would bump up when the waste gate closed, and then you, it would start to rise depending on how everything's set up. I don't have that, but uh, I do want to, when I'm doing prolong, you know, cruising for a long time, I usually like to cruise between 1800 and 2200 RPM. And I think that's a that that's okay especially because of the load of the engine unlike uh, you know I don't have a, a regular prop I have something called an auto prop and that's supposed to feather and it's supposed to if if it does what their website says that it does a regular propeller has a certain RPM that it's most efficient and when you build a propeller and you turn the pitch and you do all the sort of stuff it's designed for to be the most efficient at one RPM and um, when you're slower than that it's less efficient when you're more when you go faster than that it's less efficient the auto prop is supposed to adjust and be at its peak of the uh, torque curve you know the the, the efficiency curve th throughout the RPM thing so if it does that one of the good things is that you get a lot more low speed propulsion with it um, but you also get a lot more where the engine like if I were running it at say 1200 rpm 
I might only be at 25 or 30 percent load on the engine and usually they measure load with diesels on exhaust temperatures and they do this because they can find out that you know the, the more fuel that's getting burnt the more power you have and that sort of thing they call them pyros or I don't know that's how they work it on a tugboat anyway anyway so at that same rpm that might be 25 or 30 percent load at say 12 I'm just making these numbers up at say 1200 rpm um, with this autoprop it might be 35 or 40 percent load because because there's more resistance put on the whole engine and drivetrain and that sort of thing. Well, anyway, um, I do know that it is really important, especially if you're going for six, eight hours, you know, like when you do the ICW, that you're motoring most of the ICW. Sure, there are bays that you can sail, and yes, we've done that, but there's a lot of motoring involved. I mean, you're probably motoring an average of six to eight hours a day, and uh, it's it's, I think it's very important that you do run your, your, your diesel hooked up or at least you know, 80 to 100% load for a few minutes every day just to make sure that everything is going. Um, and, and also, like I say, if you, it, it, I'm concerned that if the turbo is spinning but it hasn't pressurized the intake you know, with the wastegate closing, then that's an issue that I'm concerned about. But anyway, to get back to how much how much how much is too much motoring as opposed to sailing I, I think that really depends on what you want to do if you are buying a boat that you really just want an oceanfront condo then you don't have to put any hours on your boat you could buy a production boat which is a much better deal than buying a blue water boat remember since my time in the bahamas i've uh, really got gained a lot more respect for production boats in that if you're not going across the oceans, buying a blue water boat seems to be a big waste of money. I think if I bought a production boat, I'd be retired right now and just living in, uh, doing the Caribbean. But that wasn't my plan. So anyway, um, if, you, uh, if you want to do the weekend sailing thing, you're not going to put a lot of hours on your engine. If the wind's not blowing that weekend, you probably won't go. If it's blowing from the wrong direction or it's raining, you probably won't go. But if you're going three or four hundred miles and you've got to come back after two weeks and come three or four hundred miles back, there's a really good chance that you're going to be motoring some or, you know, part time. And, and you know, one thing that Runa and I were talking about when Runa came with us from Florida up to... Uh, I think he got off in New York, yeah, up to New York, and uh, we were talking about how we're always so surprised that when the wind isn't great, or there, you know, we, we, we don't have any wind and we're motoring, and then we just lift up a sail just to stiffen the boat up, to keep it from rolling around a little bit, and you always gain a little bit, and uh, it's amazing how that works out. So I have the idea of motor sailing. Um, I have softened up on that where when I first started I, I wanted to be sailing as much as I could and I think and that's still what I want to nobody enjoys that engine running all the time and uh, but anyway I think that if you look at the cost of ownership if you're spending two three four hundred thousand dollars on a boat and you don't use it on this day because the wind isn't right but if you motored, you could get there. Then when the wind is right, you would be where you'd want to be. You might be losing out on a lot. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that I always say to my friend who always gives me a hard time about uh, motoring too much is I say, yeah, but you don't go anywhere. <laughs> She's going to say, oh, yes, I do. I go everywhere. <laughs> well, anyway... I see a good, you know, I think she grew up going to Block Island, and uh, she's up in Maine now, and she goes on these little weekend jaunts, and that's great. But if she was going all the way down to Florida, and she only had two weeks to do it, and the wind stopped blowing a day, she'd be more than likely to start using her engine a lot more. Uh, Jen, I'm not giving you a hard time. I think that 
there are many people that watch this channel that think the same way. And uh, I'm just saying that I don't carry a lot of guilt for running my engine. We have an engine for a reason. And uh, for many reasons, but uh, I am really proud of the fact that I've spent so much time on my boat in the last two and a half years and I put so many miles on it and that might come at the cost of almost a thousand hours that I put on it that's a lot of hours but you know what gone a lot of places done a lot of things and uh, in the big picture for me I think that's a I think that's worth every penny um, Right now, I do have an issue. I don't have an issue yet with the engine, but I should tell you guys about this anyway. And uh, I'm reluctant to tell you because I'm really scared. I'm scared because, not because it can't be done, but because I know it's gonna be an involved process to do this. I started getting reports in my engine oil analysis from ever since I bought the boat that there's elevated levels of silicone that come through in the oil. Couldn't figure out why. We thought maybe somebody had replaced a gasket and there was some RTV that was left over. It was contaminated. I thought maybe it was in the drain hose and all that sort of stuff. Well, anyway, they wrote something different because I had a higher concentration of silicone this last engine oil. And it wasn't, and it, they didn't say it was dangerous and it wasn't bad or anything, but there shouldn't be any in there. So if there's a little bit, it's not hurting the engine, but that's not what it's there for. So. They asked, had any work been done in the engine compartment? And if so, I should check my sound insulation. Once again, a $20 kit figured this out. And of course, I immediately went back and looked to see the numbers and the numbers of, this, of, the, the, of how much silicone they found in each oil change has been going up just steadily every time. And the engine insulation in my engine compartment has almost dissolved, where I mean, it's been there for 22 years now, 20, 21 years now. So the silver lining is fine, but behind it, that foam rubber probably has a silicone base. If you touch it, it turns to dust. Now there's something interesting about my boat, and if you guys know the answer to this, I wish you would tell me, but uh, my boat has an has what we'd call what I would call I don't know if it's proper or not but years ago you'd see big gasoline engines with what they call a flame arrestor around the air intake a metal thing metal screen around the air intake in case there was a backfire well anyway uh, that's all mine has I don't have an element uh, air filter and if you have an island packet or a 4J series Yanmar and you have a filter element, please contact me. You can write in the comments, but I'd even appreciate it more if you wrote to me at timbc at uh, gmail.com and let me know what filter element you're using if you have one. But I think that's something that I'm gonna do as soon as I get back to the boat now that I've got this information. But uh, I think that uh, I need to replace all the sound insulation in the engine compartment. And the reason why that's a big deal is that there are 20 years of add-ons that have been added in there, not only from the factory, but from, from a boat that's been evolving for 20 years. There's a dual Raycor filter mounted on one side, and so pulling that off the wall to get to the surface behind it is going to involve some piping issues. On the other side of that, I have a oil transfer pump. And uh, once again, there's piping involved with that. It's going to have to be moved to do it right. I mean, yeah, I could go around it and all that, but that if you're going to do something, you really ought to do it right, is my fear. Then I've got the, the one that's going to give me the most problem is an unused, up on the ceiling, there's an unused uh, battery isolator that originally when the boat, I think, was built I think it came from the factory this way but I don't know that for a fact but it had an alternator this one it had a whole AGM setup 
and the alternator would go to this thing and it was say it was a smart battery isolator and it would send power to the house bank and send power power to the uh, start bank and the two wouldn't talk to each other and so uh, anyway I've since removed that because I've in making the shift to lithium I've moved that and if you want to know why I did that I think I explained that or I, I think I have a valid argument or explanation for why that was so essential and why my electrical engineer friend made me do that. Um, and, I, and you can see that in the video where I do the lithium install. But anyway, that's a series of like one off cables that are on the ceiling. And I say the ceiling, this is, a, this is just a few inches above the engine. I've got to take all that stuff down and then remove everything and put the new stuff in and then mount every and I, I don't know i probably won't mount that back again nevertheless i'm gonna have these monster cables that i'm gonna have to cut and probably eliminate them and i'll figure that out later but that's something that I'm, i've got to do and in the the first thing i'm gonna do is uh try to if I, I like i say i don't know that the engine ever has had an air cleaner other than this thing that's wrapped around it but i'm going to put some sort of aftermarket thing there and like i say if you know which one goes there or if you know why i shouldn't do that please let me know but anyway if you have a boat and you run the engine if you're going places that's a great thing and you know um i invested heavily in solar and i invested heavily in a big alternator and smart charge controller and i invested heavily in a, in a generator with a huge uh inverter charger to charge the batteries so you won't see me running the engine to charge the batteries at anchor um, if i had a boat and i was running up a lot of engine hours running it at anchor i'd be concerned about that for a bunch of reasons one is since there's no load on it that wastegate probably never is closing I, I i don't know that but i suspect that and second of all you're burning hours that you're just sitting there where if you're burn if you're running the boat, at least you're going somewhere and you're doing something. Once again, my ideas, that's how I think about it. Let me know what you guys think. Write to me in the comments and tell me if you think that. Um, I let me know what you think. If you think a thousand hours in nine about nine thousand miles is way too much or too little or just right, or let me know what you think. Roughly about 500 miles, uh, 500 hours a year. All right, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I really appreciate it. I got one more week to go, and then I'll be back in, on, on Paquita. And hopefully, I told you last time I was going to film all this stuff, and we came all the way up the coast. And I was having such a good time with Chris Alita, and I had such a good time with Runa. And uh, it just didn't feel like filming. I felt like this was kind of a personal thing. So forgive me for that but hopefully you guys will continue watching and hopefully i'll film something fun all right see you guys take care be safe and i'll see you on the one